Hey, last week I told you why you're sexier when you cook for someone else. On today's Carefree Cooks episode, I'm going to show you what to cook for that result. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code, every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. Uh, we're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. Uh, we are the Carefree Cooks, where the people uh, that create our own recipes. This brings friends and family together. Uh, we learn every time we cook. We create our own cooking style because we practice pro methods and you know what winds up happening? You wind up loving your cooking. It's a fun, rewarding, and exciting part of life. Uh, another thing I've got for you today is a true or false. Tell me in the comments section below, is this statement true or false? Aphrodisiac foods are myths and they have no basis in science true or false in the comments below. Are aphrodisiac foods real or not? Is that statement true or false? Please tell me in the comments section below. And woohoo, it's a, it's a romantic week for cooking, everyone. And of course, the Carefree Cooks Code today is all about how to communicate love, all right? how to communicate kindness, how to communicate generosity and sensitivity through the food you cook. Those are all some of the great benefits of knowing your way around the kitchen, being able to whip up great meals. But you know, today's Carefree Cooks Code, I really can't call it a lesson necessarily because what I'm gonna show you, what we're gonna talk about today, they're pretty much the same methods uh, that I've taught before, that I teach all the time. But what I really want to happen today is that you're gonna become inspired by some of the ideas I'm about to show you. It's a, it's like a fashion show. It's gonna be a, a food fashion show. And maybe there's something that I share with you today that you think, oh, my, my wife, my husband, my partner, you know, is really gonna love that. That Maybe it would spark something. Oh, they love shrimp or, or they love black beans or uh, whatever it might be that you see. It's gonna, it's gonna spark the creativity in your mind. And then you start thinking, oh, imagine if I made that for them. Like, I I can see the, the romantic table. I, I can just see their joy. And you knew, you, you knew this was one of my favorite foods and you made it for me. Uh, yeah, a lot better than picking it off the menu. A lot better than parking your car and usually putting up with bad service. I, <laughs> I've talked about this before. I don't, I don't ever blame the chefs in a restaurant for some reason. It's always those damn servers that mess up the chef's meal. You can understand why I might be biased on that opinion. But today, it's your attention that I want. It, it's your curiosity. It, it's your creativity. Start thinking about how some of these things might fit into your own home. That's what I hope to stimulate in you today so you can stimulate something in someone else this coming Friday. Valentine's Day is what you want to do. So if you want to take some notes, if you want to take some screenshots, or actually you can always just come back and watch this video again. But Valentine's Day is going to start with breakfast right? Why not start out the most romantic day of the year right away? Don't wait until it's time to eat chocolates, you know, which for me is first thing in the morning very often. I believe in breakfast dessert. I don't, I don't know if I'm inventing that, but yes, I do believe in breakfast dessert. Uh, how about just your basic like American breakfast, some really good scrambled eggs, bacon, uh, some toast or English muffin. I see a lot of our carefree cooks making their own English muffins. If you like hash brown potatoes or if you like grits, you're part of the country that likes grits. Just how about a breakfast in bed kind of thing? How about a full breakfast for the one you love? It's a great way to start off the big Valentine's Day. If I were to do this for Heather and I, 
One of the things that we really, really like is fried rice and scrambled eggs. Uh, this is a, a offshoot of the loco moco that I make very often, something we discovered in Hawaii, which is fried rice or white rice or sushi rice, but it's rice, uh, with either a hamburger patty or like a garden patty, uh, a taro burger in Hawaii. They do grilled onions, fried eggs, beef gravy. It's a, it's a powerhouse breakfast for sure. I think it's in web cooking classes, maybe. Uh, nonetheless, another one is a smoked salmon with capers or, or shaved red onion or a, a hard boiled egg and oily fish. Uh, oh, I don't want to give away the true or false, but oily fish is something that you might want to eat on Valentine's Day. Wink, wink. I'll tell you why later. Uh, but things like salmon, cured fish, herring, uh, things like that, always a good choice for breakfast. I try and put crab in in my omelets. How about something unusual? More than your ham and cheese omelet. You have that any day of the week, your cheese omelet. How about the new shrimp and dill with brie omelet? How about this crab omelet uh, that I do all the time? I do one even sexier than that. I'm going to show you in a minute. Quiche. Quiche is so easy to do and it's so cool on Valentine's Day. You can do it in a pan by itself. Uh, what I like to do is a pâté sucré, which is a, 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 sh a sugar dough. Uh, it's you know I, I don't make it like uh, sugar cookies. I make it a little sweeter than, than the um, uh, pâté choux dough or any others that I do. So a little bit more sugar. The sweetness along with the egg in the custard, and sometimes I'll do like caramelized onions in there as well, and it gets this contrast that really gets your taste buds going in the morning for breakfast. Start out right away. Here's the one I'm talking about. This is a soft shell crab omelet. Is that not insane? <laughs> right? And this is my favorite food in the world. A soft shell crab, it, it, it's just the thing I would rather eat more than anything else. Um, but one year for Valentine's Day, I got up, I made a soft shell crab, and then I just folded an omelet around it. It was decadent. It was crazy. It was insane. It was really, really good. Um, an offshoot of that is Eggs Benedict. You know, if you're getting better and better with your hollandaise sauce, if you became a sauce boss earlier this year, uh, then you're making really good hollandaise sauce. Now's the time to put that together with your moist cooking skills, poach an egg, put it on top of a crab cake, and you've got the Baltimore, M-O-H-R, Benedict, uh, with uh, uh, hash brown potatoes, if you want, anything like that. It all starts with breakfast. But then we get to uh, dinner ideas. And one of the sexiest things that you can do in cooking, to me, one of the coolest things is a roulade or a stuffing something in something else. It just, it looks really cool. It looks like it takes a lot of skill, but it doesn't. And that, that's the key. That would be, so let me show you how I do this dish. This is a stuffed asparagus with cheddar cheese dish. And the first thing I do is I remove the skin from the chicken breasts and I lay it out on a sheet pan. I will oil it, salt and pepper it. And I'll tell you why I do that later. Push it off to the side. Take those chicken breasts and pound them out flat under a sheet of a uh, plastic wrap, give them a nice, pardon me, consistency as flat as you can without tearing the skin. So this takes a little skill. The skill is down and away from you with the mallet. Down and away from you with the mallet is the way to pound them out flat. Then pre-cooked items. I get this question a lot. If I'm going to stuff something, do I need to cook it first? Yes. You can't expect the asparagus, asparagus, asparagi, I always have that trouble, uh, to cook in the middle of the chicken breast. So the asparaguses are steamed in this instant and the cheddar cheese, a stick of cheddar. And the reason I don't put uh, a shredded cheddar or small pieces of cheddar is because it's more likely to melt and run out. So a thicker stick of cheese is what does it. Roll it up. You don't need Q-tips, uh, you don't need toothpicks, you don't need twine. The natural coagulation of proteins is going to go ahead and grab the chicken. As the chicken stiffens and shrinks, it'll grab it and you've got that uh, a beautiful roulade. The reason that I broil or roast the skin is then I slice it in julienne and I use it as a garnish and I serve this with a sweet potato. Really cool, right? So do some kind of stuffed chicken or stuffed fish dish in our web cooking classes we do a fish, a steamed fish roulade that would be really good on Valentine's Day as well. Um, hey, how about doing uh, my carbonara? This is really easy, and I love the salty bacon along with the creamy uh, cream. It's 
It's not a kosher dish <laughs> at all, uh, but it's really, really good. And it's really easy to do. Also, you get these basic ingredients, and this is onion, some bacon, uh, some tomatoes, uh, some peas, some cream, garlic, and dried pasta. And the first thing is I, I do is I saute uh, the bacon uh, in a pan, the bacon will render its own fat. You don't ever need to add oil to a pan that you're going to saute something as fatty as bacon. So the bacon will render its own fat. Then I'm going to put some garlic in. And at this time, this photo that you see, I was roasting my own garlic. It's a really cool thing to do. Get a whole bunch of cloves of garlic, douse them in olive oil, roast them in the oven, puree them and put them in a jar in ref your refrigerator. So this is extra sweet roasted garlic that goes in the pan with the rendered bacon and the onions. Then I'm going to add some flour and of course any sauce bosses out there you know this is a roux. This is a pan roux I'm making now with the rendered fat from the bacon, the garlic, the onions and the flour makes the roux and along comes some milk. The milk is going to make a bechamel sauce. Bacon fat, flour, roux, milk, bechamel sauce right in the pan. Then I'm going to add those diced tomatoes. You could do tomato concasse if you want, or get, take them right out of a can. Diced tomatoes out of a can will work as well. A whole ton of Parmesan cheese as if it were airlifted from a helicopter. That's how much Parmesan cheese you should put in, uh, whatever it is to your taste, uh, of, of course. Uh, and then this is all going to come together in that really nice creamy sauce like that. Peas go in there as well with the tomatoes. Then we come along with the pre-cooked pasta. The pasta can be cooked hot out of the water and then in right into this dish that you've made, or you can par cook the pasta, uh, shock it with cold water because we're about to reheat it in this sauce. So put the pasta right in the sauce, bring this to a soft simmer, barely because you don't ever want to boil milk. And then when we add more Parmesan cheese to the top of it, it's even better. And you've got my uh, pasta carbonara. That's a great dish for Valentine's Day. And it uses you know, a pan roux and a base basic saute method. Okay, I know around the holidays in our Carefree Cooks community, I did see a lot of meat. I know we have some vegetarians, but it seemed like it was all about prime rib and lamb chops. So if you want to make some really sexy lamb chops for Valentine's Day, to me, cooking the lamb chops themselves, it just isn't that difficult. Uh, I'm going to either roast them or broil them, and I'm going to cook them to an internal temperature. For me, about 145 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and I do that with an internal thermometer. So that part's not hard. Apply the heat until the thermometer beats, beeps. The hard part is this incredibly, do you see this? This incredibly sexy, shiny gravy that I've got over there. And let me show you how I do that. I take my lamb chops and I clean them of all excess fat. I don't like trim at all on my lamb chops. You know, that like on a pork chop, sometimes you want that quarter inch trim, you know, the fat there. People think it holds in the other fat somehow. I don't, I don't know how that happens. Uh, to me, it's I just have to cut it off and throw it away on my plate. So why not cut it off before it goes in the oven? And here's exactly the reason why, because all the rest of that fat, I'm gonna render in the pan. Remember just a few seconds ago when I showed you how to do the carbonara? We rendered the fat from the bacon. So why can't you do that with pork chop fat? Why can't you do that with lamb chop fat? And that's exactly what we're doing here. Render the fat from the trim, from the excess trim from the lamb. Why throw it in the trash? There's flavor in there still to be had. So render that fat. It's on the bottom of the pan, just like that bacon was. And then put some onions in there. We're gonna saute the onions in the rendered lamb fat. How do you think those onions are gonna taste? They're gonna taste like lamb, right? That's really, really cool. You're gonna get them nice and brown because we want a brown sauce and any color added to the onion can be added to our sauce as well. As those onions continue to caramelize, then we're gonna deglaze the pan with some red wine. Uh, people ask me all the time, what's the best wine to cook with? I mean, it, it's like, you know, what's the best onion? What's the best carrot? It, they all have distinct flavors, but for a dish that I want like deep, 
dark, savory flavor, I'm going to use a deep, dark wine, like a Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, like a Spanish Rioja, Tempranillo, a grape that, that they let get really, really dark, you know, and age for quite a while. Deglaze the pan and then let that reduce. This might have to cook for 10 or 15, 20 minutes. I don't know the time. It all depends on how much heat and how much wine you put in there. But you want this to, re to reduce to a really thick, sloppy mess. I mean, it looks like a red onion slop at this point. You're gonna think you're going wrong, but you're not. Hang in there, reduce it until it's almost dry, and then go ahead and add some beef broth. Or, or if you're fortunate enough that you made lamb broth or some kind of darker broth, go ahead and add the broth to it. Remember, it's not the wine that makes the sauce. The wine deglazes and is reduced until it's almost gone. Otherwise, you have a very acidic, very grapey, you know, flavored sauce. The wine has to go. By the time it's done evaporating, that's when you add your beef broth or flavorful broth. This is what makes the foundation of your sauce. So go ahead, add the beef broth to as much of a level as you want. The, the less beef broth, the pardon me, the stronger the flavor of the wine, the more beef broth, the more beef flavor. But now is the time to strain all this. Get those bits of fat out of there. Get, get all that stuff that we talked about. We don't want to leave the rendered fat in our sauce. Strain it. And then uh, when you transfer it to another pan, having strained it, you have gotten as much flavor out of that sauce as possible, but it's probably too thin. And that's when you take the dark roux cube out of your freezer. Hopefully all carefree cooks have dark roux cubes in their freezer. Take that cube out of the freezer and drop it in this flavorful liquid to go ahead and thicken this sauce. And then of course, like I said, the lamb chops are easy enough to cook. Once you have put that compound flavor, the rendered fat, the onions, the wine, the beef broth, the thickened darkness of the roux all strained and thickened, that's when you get this beautiful, shiny, velvety sauce. Okay, is that fancy enough for you? All right, how about we go to Lobster American, okay? Or American, if you add an E to it and say it with a snotty French inflection. Lobster American is one of my favorite dishes, and it's the same type of thing as adding flavor on top of flavor on top of flavor, just like we did the lamb chops. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take those shrimp shells out of my freezer and make a shrimp stock out of it. Simply simmering shrimp shells in water, I said it, <laughs> and then uh, macerating that flavor into the water, strain the shells out, we've got a shrimp stock. We're gonna take some of our lobster tails and with my poultry shears, I'm gonna cut with the scissors up the front and back of the lobster, separate the shells from the meat. Separate the shells from the meat. That, that's that picture there. Then with some onion and clarified butter, because I want a higher temperature that I'm going to cook with. I don't want the milk solids burning. Clarified butter. There it is. I'm going to go ahead and add the shells to the onion and butter. Saute the shells. Where have you seen this before? This is starting to look like a bisque procedure, right? And that's exactly what it is. I want to, again, extract all the flavor of these shells into the butter so the shells are the first things that are cooked. I crack them up as much as I can. I create as much surface area as I possibly can to get as much of the shell flavor in the butter. Now it's time to deglaze and I use brandy. Generally use a brandy, a cognac, a very, a port even if you wanted to, but a very woodsy, very strong flavored liqueur. Again, the deglazing procedure is reduce it until it's almost gone. I don't want a brandy flavored sauce. I want the hint of brandy remaining in those shells. The next step is going to be adding some tomato paste to this. And again, this isn't even the dish. You know, I'm just making the flavorful liquid that we're going to need for that great sauce. Some tomato paste in there. The tomato paste allows it to simmer. Once we have this whole thing simmering, now I'm going to add that shrimp stock that I made. Adding the shrimp stock to the shells, the tomato paste, the brandy, the onions, the clarified butter, and it turns out like this. It turns out to this beautiful, rich, shell-colored 
Bisque is what I've made here, this sauce with the shrimp stock as well. Let's strain out all those shells so that we have that flavor for liquid. And now it's time to actually cook the lobster. So I've cut the lobster up into cubes. I'm going to cook that in clarified butter as well because I want to use a higher temperature and cook this really quickly. Lobster meat cooked in clarified butter deglaze with some of that really flavorful liquid that I've got there. There it is. I'm going to mount it with heavy cream. The heavy cream will help thicken it as well. And there's the finished dish. So, you know, it doesn't look like much in this picture here, but think about those many layers of flavor that I've put into that dish with the shrimp shells, the brandy, the cream, the shrimp stock. That's the idea of making something incredibly flavorful. What would you pay for this? At your local restaurant, this is a $75 plate in, in, in my downtown area, if you could even get it. And I'll tell you what, it's way better than the restaurant. You know, first of all, it cost me a fraction of that. And I have the pride in doing it. It's a, it's a big, big difference. Uh, maybe you could do some shrimp stir fry if you're into that. Saute some garlic, shallot. Uh, onion, uh, uh, ginger in a saute pan. I've got julienne portobello mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms. I'm going to go ahead and saute them. Add my shrimp to the pan along with the mushrooms. I've got some steamed carrots that I'm now going to add. I, you know, it's just that direct conductive heat. It's too quick in a stir fry to hope that I'm going to make a carrot soft. So the carrots are the only thing that's cooked ahead of time. They're going to be made soft. Then I'm going to go ahead and deglaze with some soy sauce or some plum wine or uh, some kind of flavorful liquid that's going to go along with the stir fry. Add some pre-cooked rice noodles or udon noodles if I want. <laughs> Stand on my head and squeeze uh, some lime juice <laughs> into there. I'm sorry about that. And, and there's my stir fry in one pan. That dish only takes about 20 minutes or so, and that is a love-struck Valentine's dish for sure. It's your udon noodle basic shrimp stir-fry. And shellfish uh, is another aphrodisiac ingredient. Oops, I hope I didn't give it away. Just like smoked salmon, oops, I hope I didn't give it away <laughs> that you can put into your, uh, into your dishes. Hey, as long as we're grooving on shrimp, let's get out the Old Bay seasoning and make a, a good shrimp and grits dish. Again, there's that jar of roasted garlic with some more bacon, some some onions, some mushrooms, some shrimp, some dill, some Old Bay. We're back to the basic saute procedure. You see me do this again and again. Let's render the fat from the bacon, cook the bacon, render the fat, add the onions to that rendered fat. Uh, then we're going to add the shrimp to that. The shrimp are going to take longer to cook than the white button mushrooms will, much softer than the portobellos and the shiitakes. Uh, we'll let that just steam together for a little bit. Continue cooking, serve it with our cheese grits and the pan sauce that really doesn't have to be thickened at all. Uh, what else do we got here? How about a chicken parmesan? Easy to make. Get some good quality mozzarella cheese, serve it on the side uh, with some pasta. Another great Valentine's Day idea. Idea. Uh, hopefully I can see these because I got these these are meals that I cook every day of the week you know this is how carefree cooks cook all the time but it's time to show your muscles on Valentine's Day especially uh, this is an Alfredo with broccoli and Romano cheese with penne pasta really good fajita shrimp with a lot of spice avocado and black beans another aphrodisiac two aphrodisiac three three aphrodisiac foods on one plate the shrimp the beans and the avocados as well how cool is that that's really cool uh fish again any kind of fin fish and this is a beautiful flounder that i did with a shrimp sauce made similar to the lobster American that I showed you. Uh, simmering the shells in water to make a stock and then using that shrimp stock to make the sauce. This is served in white rice also. Uh, this was a Greek chicken I think I made. Cubes of feta cheese on top served uh, with a poached sweet potato. Uh, tuna is another thing. Again, these oily fish are really good for you with the omega-3s. They're good for your health. They're good for your heart. They're good for your love life as well, people say. 
today. Uh, but a seared, rare tuna, wonderful idea to serve. Uh, how about make a burrito? Wrap something in something else. Here's a basic ground beef burrito with onions and peppers and mushrooms, I think. It gets wrapped up. It gets sauced on the top, put it in the oven, and then when it winds up on the plate, you cut it open so you can see what it looks like. Sharp looking dish, right? Uh, how about using your palate? We've talked about this before, contrasting things on the palate. This is one of my favorite dishes to make. It, it's a it's either chicken or fish because I make it both ways, seared, sauteed, nice and brown. But the sauce is a really creamy bechamel sauce with crumbled bacon on top. Now, that contrast of the creamy dairy with the crunchy, smoky bacon, it's a, it's a really good contrast to consider for Valentine's Day. Uh, lamb chops, use your thermometer. It could not be easier to roast expensive cuts of meat when you have a thermometer. And I usually serve this with string beans amandine, another one of my favorite dishes. Uh, how about a, a shrimp cocktail? Easy to poach or steam shrimp, make that look sexy. Go further down the seafood trail. This is one of my favorite things. Do a chopino, uh, do a, a seafood boil, steamed seafood. Go for the ca crab cake like I always do. Go ahead and make a pizza. Pizza on Valentine's Day when somebody else doesn't ring your doorbell, when you make it yourself, can be really, really romantic. Shrimp and grits I've shown you. Crab cakes I've shown you. Oh. Uh, shaping things. If you have a little ramekin cup that you can coat with oil or butter or even water, put your rice in there, turn it upside down, and shape things nicely for Valentine's Day. I've shown you that. I've shown you that. And then you're headed for dessert. When you learn how to temper chocolate, melting, it's not just melting chocolate. You have to temper chocolate so it comes back to a hard shell, dip some strawberries in it, then slash some white chocolate across it. Or one of my favorites of all time is the strawberry crepe with fresh whipped cream. Now, is that enough? <laughs> enough Valentine's Day dinner ideas for you? What was there, 50 in there? And step-by-step -step procedures for you to do it as well. I told you why you're sexier when you cook. Now you need to go ahead and cook one of those things and you're really going to blow the top off, so to speak. Um, we're not the only ones to cook sexy, though. It goes on in our, <laughs> in our Carefree Cooks community. They're getting ready for Valentine's Day as well. Let's see what the dish of the week is like, because really one of the greatest things about being a carefree cook is that you have the confidence to let your creativity run wild. And William, <coughs> pardon, William has heard of Beef Wellington. We've all heard of Beef Wellington. William might have even seen my videos about my mini chicken Wellington appetizers that I sold thousands of <laughs> when I had my catering company. But you know something about William? I get the feeling that once William is confident in a method and then his creativity gets cranked up, you know what this is? This right here? This is Lobster Wellington. Oh my God, never thought of that. What a great idea. So here's a 51st idea from William to you. Wrap a lobster tail in puff pastry. Make lobster Wellington. Unbelievable, outstanding. Uh, Kathy is using her confidence in methods to make this beautiful salmon saute. She put some garlic, water, chestnuts, pineapple, and butter. A buttery pineapple salmon. That sounds really good. That's something you might have to try. Jason is always cranking it out. <laughs> this guy, just too much. And now it's this beautiful dish of pork chops with an orange sauce on white rice with roasted Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts are the thing lately. I'll tell you, every, but every menu everywhere is has these little cabbages that everybody hated 10 years ago, you know? Now everybody loves them. But the thing I love about Jason's plate is kind of the feng shui going on here, you know? There's there's a, a, a just a display that I really, really like. The plate looks so balanced, really nice, great Valentine's Day plate. Uh, and like I said, there are a lot of pizzas uh, getting posted in our Carefree Cooks community this week, but the best caption was from Paula. Uh, Paula said that her boys now prefer her pizza over takeout and they get upset if she doesn't make it every Friday. Paula, come on. It's a lot easier to pick up the phone. Why don't you just call for a pizza? Why do you bother going through all those steps? Yeah, that's why, because your boys love it. They're proud of you. You're proud of cooking for them. It's an unbelievable cycle. That's what cooking does for us. Uh, the uh, true or false today, aphrodisiac foods have are just myth. 
They have no basis in truth. Oh, that's so false. It has been proven again and again that, no, it's not like the old Spanish fly, slip a pill in an amulet kind of thing, but there are foods that make your heart race. The chocolate has phenylethylamine. It, it causes you to flush. Spicy foods increase your metabolism. They flush the tips of your ears. They do things to you just like when you're in love. They, they, they cause the same effect. So how could you say cooking with aphrodisiac foods is only myth? It's absolutely true, and I showed you all the ones that you can do today. But look, if you know someone that'd like to put a little more sexy into their cooking, go ahead and like or share this video with them. Come on. Who doesn't like to get sexier, right? Who doesn't want to have a great Valentine's Day? I know they're going to appreciate it. And look, if you don't think that aphrodisiac foods really exist, if you don't think that there are specific foods that can really turn you on, I'm here to prove to you that it's true. So I definitely would want you to know what foods to cook with on Valentine's Day and how to put them into your own cooking. You can find out in my latest free online class. It's Romancing the Kitchen, the foods and techniques techniques to create a romantic restaurant in your own home. Go to webcookingclasses.com slash V-Day to hold your spot. So until next Tuesday at noon Eastern time, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your romantic cooking success. Bye-bye everyone.